Hi there, everyone. My name is Flavio Zavidro, and I'm a research associate at Cambridge's University Social Decision Making Lab. I'm also a member of FORT, the Framework for Open Reproducible Research Training. On behalf of the FORT community, I'm delighted to be here today and to have the opportunity to introduce you to Big Team Science and tomorrow to introduce you to FORT. I would like to thank the organizers, the brilliant Nadia, Natalia, Alma, Ashbaria, and Neha for their kind invitation to this great event. There are so many amazing speakers, and I hope to learn a lot about representation in Big Team Science. Today I'll be presenting a talk entitled Big Team Science as an Opportunity to Fulfill the Promises of Open Scholarship. My presentation tries to contextualize Big Team Science as a part of the larger umbrella of open scholarship movement and discuss how Big Team Science can be a solution for um, a more robust and generalizable science. I will then argue that Big Team Science can be also an opportunity for us to realize the goals of diversity, equity, inclusion and accessibility, and social justice in academia. I will also apply a critical lens to Big Team Science to identify the areas of improvement and finally discuss how we can rethink together ways to redistribute credit, resources, and expertise towards a more just science for all. All right, so let's start from the beginning. What is Big Team Science? It's when scientists from widely dispersed institutions and locations pull together resources and expertise to complete projects that would otherwise be impossible. Big Team Science is part of the larger movement of open science um, that aims to improve the rigor and transparency with which we do research. Just to provide you with a more complete definition of open science, it's an umbrella term that reflects the idea that all scientific knowledge should be openly accessible, transparent, rigorous, replicable, and accumulative, all of which are considered fundamental features of the scientific endeavor. This is by no means a definitive uh, uh, definition, but it, it's an average definition. Um, open science is thought to have seven, ma six major aspects, open data, open methodology, like materials, code, um, data, um, open source, open access, open peer review, and open educational resources. A relatively new aspect is open collaboration, uh, which includes big team science um, and citizen science and can be subsumed uh, into large scale open collaborations. All right. So what is Big Team Science a solution for? There's a great preprint on the benefits, barriers, and risks of Big Team Science by Forcher and all that I really recommend. But in broad strokes, Big Team Science has the potential to spur scientific progress, connect scientific communities and subfields, sponsor multidisciplinarity and exchange of skills, and overcome many of the caveats of small team research. So think of problems in replicability, generalizability, external validity, and so on. In the social sciences, the number of big team science projects have been increasing over the past few years, and definitely across disciplines. So today it includes uh, psychology, political science, sociology, political psychology, behavioral science, and communication science. This big team science movement has also inspired the growth of scientific organizations that are dedicated only to developing the infrastructure, workflows, knowledge, know-how that are necessary to complete these large distributed collaborative projects. So examples are mini labs one, two, three, mini babies, mini primates, mini dogs, mini birds. There are many minis. There's psychological science accelerator, there's fort, and there's also topic specific collaborations like TISP, for example, the trust in science and populism, the international collaboration on social and moral psychology of COVID-19, and there's the international collaboration to understand climate action. But these are just a few, there are many more. So to me, Big Team Science is an opportunity, perhaps the best opportunity that we have to realize the most difficult goals of open scholarship, goals which have been the hardest to make progress on, on diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and social justice. And as I mentioned before, Big Team Science can be conceived as part of open science or how I would like to call it open scholarship movement. And then for me, Big Team Science is about inclusion of disenfranchised folks. Big Team Science is about coalition building and redistribution of expertise, redistribution of resources. And in doing so, we can pave the way towards a more transparent and robust science, sure, but also towards a more inclusive, diverse, accessible, and equitable science. 
And this together means a better and more just science for all, a more just science for minoritized groups and a more just science for folks in low and middle income countries, and not only for those folks at affluent countries. As we scientists try to fulfill the scientifically desirable goals of generalizability, replicability, and external validity, we do so via recruiting researchers and participants from minoritized populations. But it's important to recognize that this hasn't yet come about in tandem with redressing or helping redress structural disadvantages that these populations face. So let me now spend some time applying an admittedly critical lens to some of the norms, practices, and culture of victim science, and perhaps to some extent to science in general, as a means to identify areas of improvement. Let's start with the fact that most victim science projects have been led and are led by researchers at Anglo-Saxon institutions and universities as well as from the global north. This is an issue. Another issue is that while we are getting better at giving credit for people's work, most researchers from the global south end up squished between dozens, if not hundreds, of authors, which dilute their contributions. Also, researchers from the global south, when collecting data, are often left to their own devices with demands or to comply with demands that most make sense in the global north. So for example, we do know that there is often a qualitative difference in effort and difficulty when it comes to collecting data in places where there isn't versus there is a polling infrastructure. So polling infrastructure, being able to go to a company and easily collect data makes this process much easier. But in the global south and low income uh, countries, there's many places where polling infrastructure is non-existent. But we don't account for these extra hurdles in assigning people's credit or authorship order. In the same vein, what an often required characteristic of big team science is to collect large representative samples, which are not only costly, they cost a lot of money, but for which there is never funding. So they have to find funding to collect that data. Not to mention that the very idea of representation is difficult to translate to countries where, for example, the percentage of population that have access to computers on a daily basis to do an online survey or have a high school level re reading level is very low. So all of these extra hurdles do not get recognized when assigning credit. Of course, there are also structural problems for big team science. And we need to look at these. Let's do that now. Journals like PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, still refuse to adapt their editorial practices to recognize formally people's contributions in a fair way for big team science projects that have several hundreds of uh, co-authors. But PNAS is not alone. Editorial practices in other journals have also had issues with big team science papers and, and projects. The same problem compounds because institutions themselves, where big, where big team science researchers are in both Global South and North, they do not always recognize contributions in these projects. And this can detrimentally affect contributors' ability to um, uh, pr progress in their careers and participate in big team science. In addition, there is a culture problem that most recognition that we all give credit for go to leaders of these projects, first, last, and corresponding authors. We just don't have a culture that values or incentivizes the data collection or understands the troubles uh, of collecting data in low and middle income countries. I haven't yet seen folks commenting on things like, wow, this researcher collected data or super cool data or super unique data in Ghana, Laos, Bolivia, or, or in these contexts. Much of the contrary, often research that uh, is submitted to journals and surveys or used populations from non-Anglo-Saxon non countries have to collect data in the global north to avoid being told uh, in a desk rejection that their study is not generalizable. 
presumably because the norm or you know the literature is almost entirely built upon participants from the global north so samples that deviate from this are not considered generalizable and that's a problem a final point now regarding inequality admittedly perhaps an important point but minor is that in several big team science um, uh, projects collecting data um, on several countries rely on this market research suppliers or pulling infrastructure from the global north that is to say that we contact companies in the global north that then subcontract local firms which does not help uh, with the distribution of resources and funds or enrich uh, the country where we are collecting data. So there's also uh, the need to rethink about the ways in which um, um, we've, we prioritize easiness of collection rather than uh, redistribution. So all of this is to say that while it is of extreme importance to investigate the generalizability, the replicability, and external validity of findings. When we are using minoritized and disprivileged population, this process should not come without applying a critical lens to our practices and norms to identify areas of improvement. This is important to, it is important to interrogate ourselves. To what extent, in the name of science, researchers from the global north might be benefiting from the unique resources of the global south without sharing with them their fair share and this is of course does not imply intention it's of course without intention but we need to interrogate um, what the consequences of our actions nonetheless it is in this sense that big team science can be an opportunity to think proactively about ways to foster social justice in our research practices, or at least to not do harm. It's an opportunity to set norms that aim to rethink how privileged the global North is and how we can redistribute credit, resources, and expertise instead of adopting the status quo, which can be thought of as an unintended extractivism, extractivism of intellectual labor. It is true that these topics are sensitive, that they have parallels with colonialism and racism that is embedded in our society and institutions. These are extremely complicated matters, and for many, they touch on sore spots. I'm not saying it will be easy, but it's crucial to think about these issues now, because if we don't, the status quo tends to benefit those that are already privileged. Let's remember that. And because later down the line, the harm will be already done. So what would reform look like? I don't know yet. I don't know exactly how, but here are some suggestions. First, I would say it's a process. It's a process that should be based on listening. Listening folks from low and middle income countries, learning about their struggle. And we need a lot of introspection on finding ways to be more helpful and more constructive. But as far as suggestion goes, here's a few more. First, I would like to see more events like this one. Abrer is not only a terrific organization founded by extremely competent women but its mission is so inspiring. But let's not let the folks at Abreer be the only organization to be responsible for events and a mission as important as this one. Let's ask them what we can do to help them to propagate their mission. If you are in a position of power, a position and responsibility at your own organization, at open science organizations or DEI organizations, please, Consider giving visibility to a career. Give them prominence, the resources that they are producing and have produced, like this conference. Send an email about a career, their mission, and highlight them in your newsletter. Their mission is our mission, and we cannot sit idly by. But we can take responsibility as well and hold similar events. Let's spread the word of this beautiful mission. 
representation is so important and so is diversity, equity and inclusion as well as social justice for big team science. And always don't forget to give appropriate credit to a Breer pathbreaking mission, its event and resources. And I also would like to see big team science projects to invest time and resources in adopting anti-racist and feminist practices and norms. Let's also help decolonize our big team science research practices and think about ways to do better with respect to potentially extractivist approach to inclusion and diversity, which is current norm in big team science projects. I would like to see as well a big team science project that explicitly incentivizes discussions about how their current practices tend to favor those who are already privileged. Putting yourself, your project, the leadership into that position can yield a lot of learning for every single party involved. I also would like to see big team science projects to provide funding for data collection for low and middle income countries in, in the global south. I would like to see big team science projects to share their expertise and know-how publicly, to invest time in making their knowledge accessible via educational materials for all. Perhaps we can produce courses, introductions to this new, very exciting subject. Perhaps we can offer a mentoring program or a mentoring exchange of expertise. Lastly, I would like to see big team science projects that credit people work relative to the structural barriers that they face in order to contribute. This is so important moving forward. Crediting folks that is deciding the authorship order based on academics privilege, or at least that takes academics privilege into account is a must in my opinion. It is important to realize However, in general, the current ways that we assign authorship order tends to benefit those who are already privileged. But I'm sure we can do more, so much more. So let's put our heads together, listen to folks from low and middle income countries in the global south, and find a better way to move our science forward for all of us towards the science of the homo sapiens, yeah? Thank you for your time, and I hope this talk was useful. Please know that this is the first time I present this talk, so your critical and constructive feedback is really appreciated. Either or, I would like to hear from you. Lastly, I wanted to give a shout out to my Ford fam, without whom I would never imagine knowing about these issues whatsoever. They are everything to me, and I'm here for them. Here are a few links to learn more about Ford, and please tune in tomorrow for our dedicated panel on Fort. Thank you, everyone, and bye.